Welcome to the Tyneside Irish Cultural Society podcast with me, Michael McNally. 2021. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome back to our podcast. Well, I think we were all hoping that this year was going to be a bit different to most of last year. However, it's Groundhog Day and here we are in lockdown. Let's just hope the vaccine rollout is going to have a positive impact for everyone. And we hope that soon we'll all be back together, cuddling the people we care about. I think that's what I'm missing the most. Now, there's an awful lot of creative talent in the Northeast, particularly amongst the Tyneside Irish community, both musical and dance. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first guest of 2021 from a magnificent band with a tremendous history, the mighty Doonans. Please welcome Kevin Doonan. I've been very well, thanks uh, indeed, Michael. It's been uh, it's been strange times, but uh, it's been strange times for everybody. You you grew up in, a, in a, an amazingly talented family. And I, I remember as a kid, actually, you know, seeing your dad perform with you. I'm sure you were there. Um, I was only, I mean, I'm only 30 now, you know, but uh, it was quite a few years back. And, uh, and I remember my dad saying to me, you know, that your dad was an absolute legend and, and a world champion. Just tell us about what it was like growing up in your house. It's strange, actually. We, did, we just kind of took it all for granted. Um, uh, you know, the, the comings and goings of various people in the family. But also what we hadn't realised um, until much later was just how Irish the family was. And not just our family, but uh, lots of other families in heaven and Gerald. Um, and we used to do things that, you know, um, you know, you, you, you now associate typically with kind of Catholic families, where you'd all sit at, you know, you, you would go to bed and you'd all kneel down at the bottom of the bed and you'd kind of pray there saying, God bless Grandad, God bless that, no, no, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was something that you realised later, you just thought that was normal, but in fact you realised it was a sort of an Irishness input rather than just a straightforward Catholic, English Catholic family. Um, but of course, what you've got to remember as well is that um, certainly around about the 1920s and 30s, um, heaven was known as actually Little Island. And there was a lovely little book uh, which was written about Little Island, you know, talking about heaven. Um, and, the, the, and the families who, you know, who were in there, particularly in you know, kind of Ellison Street and those kind of areas, there would be what my mum and dad would call a hooli, where they would invite, um, you know, just like the members of the family, local friends would all come to the house um, and you know you they would, they would all sing the party piece you know they would always play their party tune um, inevitably you'd have people like my dad doing a, a couple of tunes on the piccolo um, and that was stuff that we just found to be normal of course when we get to the um you know the 1960s you know when uh, myself and michael started to think you know that maybe there's more to music than just rock and roll um, and maybe you know there's something in this kind of Irish music. We had our own folk club, um, you know, which was set up in the uh, late '60s. Yeah. You know, people like uh, Dave Swarbrick and Martin Carthy, you know, playing at the club and staying at my mum and dad's, um, and and just hearing them play in the house, you know. And one of the, I'll always remember there was one um, lovely moment uh, when my dad uh, was teaching Dave Swarbrick. A couple of tunes. There was um, a sequence of tunes. There was a uh, slip jig called uh, Sport the Chase, a reel called Rakish Paddy and Toss of Feathers. And I think there was another tune as well. Um, and that was at the time when Martin Carthy and Dave Swarbrick were, were like at the, the top of their game. But they split up and Dave Swarbrick went on to uh, join um, Fairboard Convention. And the first album they did with Dave Swarbrick that little sequence of tunes appeared, you know, in in, in, in one of the tracks. And I was thinking to myself, I remember, I remember when you told them that, those tunes. Aye. That's amazing, uh, that's amazing. It you know, must have been, um, I mean, I know, because obviously similar sort of family, um, musical and everything else, and, and having that atmosphere in the house, but having those kind of visitors and, and you're taking it for granted and not really appreciating at the time how amazing these people are. You had loads of quite famous people stay in your house, didn't you, over the years? Did you realise at the time how important no. and significant they were? No, I mean, uh, they, they, at the time, you've got to remember, this is at the time of the growth in folk music. And they, of course, of kind were 
kind of coming of a coming of age, you know, uh, themselves really, you know, as as people. I mean, they were all young blokes at that time. They were all in the you know kind of early early to mid twenties. Certainly, the Irish crowd would stay at my mum and dad's if they did a gig locally, or they did a, a, a booking at the Viking Folk Club. Um, so you'd have people like the Furies staying, um, you'd have Martin Carthy, Barbara Dixon, Billy Connolly did a gig at the Viking, uh, Jerry Rafferty, um, and all of these people, you know, were um, and were always extremely kind, they always loved my mother, you know, because my mother would make sure that, um, you know, there was always a, there was a hot meal there ready for them, um, you know, breakfast was always great to send them off on the way. Uh, and I'll always remember Christy Moore, uh, and I guess he did this all over the country. I'm, sh I'm sure it wasn't particularly for my mum, but he always made a point of maybe if the gig was on a Friday night. On a Saturday morning, he would go out, uh, buy some flowers and a box of chocolates, and bring them back for my mum. You know, they are Julie. Thank you very much for putting this up for the night. You know. That's oh, and I remember something else as well. In, in the Chieftains, uh, they didn't stay at the house, but um, they did a gig. Um, at um, I think it was um, oh, the Guildhall in Newcastle, um, and they all piled back to my mum and dad's house. I remember the harvest, Derek Bell with um, with uh, the chieftains. I, I distinctly remember him sat on my mum and dad's stairs playing "Happy Birthday" in real time, jig time, and then in proper time as well, because it was <laughs> it was somebody's birthday, and he could because he's a clever bugger. <laughs> oh hi, definitely. Now I, I keep seeing little glimpses of catch things about Rosie or. You know some of the other younger ones, and and just this last week I saw a video, um, with with Michael singing a, a, a track cover of um, if God was one of us, and oh, it's I keep, yeah. oh fabulous, isn't it? And yeah, and, yeah. and I, I'm always absolutely hugely impressed every time I see anything to do with any of you, um, and sort of knowing John, <laughs> your brother, who I who I sort of see around the local scene doing gigs and stuff, and we always have a laugh and we get on really well. He's, he's so immensely proud of all of you, you know, and, and, and you know, it just, he never goes on about it, but he is. And, and mm -hmm. I, I really sort of love that and admire so, that. Tell us a little bit about the band, how, it, how, how it's formed. I know there's a tr it comes from a former band with your dad. Yeah. You just tell yeah. us how it evolved and are there any plans in future to be doing some, some touring? Um, well, of course, it goes back a long way. Um, really, the, the band itself, uh, which, is, which is called the Mighty Dunans, Prior to that was called the Doonan Family Band. So I came back from Liverpool, I think about 1977, something like that. Um, Michael had been in Hedgehog Pie, you know, as a pro musician. And at that time, that band seemed to be, you know, kind of run its time. So myself, Michael and my dad got together um, only for a few months to do a couple of gigs. Very quickly brought in uh, Jed Grimes um, and uh, Phil Murray. And we had a couple of fantastic dancers, um, Julie Johnson and Angela Elliott. Um, I mean, both tip-top dancers at the, at the time. Uh, Jed left the band, we brought in Stu Luckley. Uh, Angela and Julie had left the band and we had in, for a time, our niece Sarah from uh, Leeds and uh, Frances, Michael's daughter. There's, there's lots of these other connections. Sarah, in the meantime, left, it left with with Francis as, as a solo dancer. Michael's other daughter, Rosie, who you know is, a, is now a well-established singer-songwriter in her own right. And Phil's son, Ben, who'd um, uh, you know been, been with a, a pro band for a good while. Uh, he's the kind of the walk-on singer-player with the, uh, the show um, uh, War Horse uh, down in London, and, and of course was on tour. Uh, but the, of course the tour last March was curtailed um, you know, once the coronavirus came. Um, Stu's son, um, Jamie, by this time was playing drums. And we, we had a kind of talk about it. And we thought that the Doonan family band, which was a, essentially a, a, an acoustic band, although it obviously would play through a PA system, but effectively it was an acoustic band. Um, maybe we could do a wee bit more, but also try to um, promote really the talents of the, like the younger members of the family. Uh, or families, I should say, three families. It was, it was one of the first gigs that we did. The guy who was doing the MC for you know for the day, in, and it was leading up to giving us a big kind of rise for the for the audience for announcing us to come on. He said, uh, "We've got this new band. It was called it was called the um, um, the Duna Family Band. I'm not sure what what it's going to be called, but here we are. Let's hear it for the Mighty Dunans." 
and we all, I think we all off stage said, that's a really good name. <laughs> so that's, it's, it's stuck ever since from that. I'll keep tabs on what's happening with the band and, and obviously I'll announce any, any touring or big gigs that are coming up. But is there any chance of giving us a, a little bit of a blast on the fiddle? It'll be the first, yeah. musician, first musical performance of 2021. Oh, really? I better, I better get it right. <laughs> but listen, these, these, are, these, these are two reels. Um, and actually, I, I was reminded that um, I, I, we learnt these. In fact, we, we kind of play these two reels together, a Sligo made and a high reel. And we play, we play these and learnt them from, uh, again, from the 60s, um, who came to the folk club. Uh, there were a trio of sisters called the Grain Sisters. Uh, one sang, the other played guitar, and um, Francie Grain played... Um, uh, banjo mandolin. So uh, th this is it. This is Sligo Maiden High Reel. <laughs> Tremendous. What a great way to start the year. That was interesting when Kevin was talking about growing up as a traditional Irish family in Jarrow and Heaven. How Irish are we all? Well, I've got an expert. Meet Rory Cullen from Irish in Britain. Hey, well, Great to be here. Given Brexit and everything else that's gone on the last couple of years, it's it's a lot of people are now sort of panicking about the future. They have worries and concerns. This is aside from coronavirus. And I, I know a lot of people want to know how Irish am I, you know, and can I get a passport for Ireland? Mm. So yeah. you know, what's the criteria for getting a passport? Well, the criteria for getting a passport is um, if you were born in Britain, what you need to have is either an Irish born grandparent and by Irish born, I mean someone who's born on the island of Ireland. So that's quite um, that's quite an open way of interpreting it. Um, or you need an Irish parent, so someone who's hold, who held who holds Irish citizenship. Um, now, it might not be you might not immediately be an Irish citizen if you have an Irish grandparent. And what you have to do first of all is apply through a process called foreign birth registration. And then once you've got the foreign birth registration, you can then apply to be an Irish citizen through by, by receiving a passport. Um, there's a bit of kind of fiddly rules about if it's if you're relying on the Irish parent. So if you were born abroad to an Irish parent and abroad is in Britain, if you're born in Britain to an Irish parent who was born in Ireland, you're pretty much automatically eligible for a passport. If you were born in Britain to an Irish parent who wasn't born in Britain, you then have to apply through foreign birth registration. But also that that parent needs to have been an Irish citizen when you were born for you able to, to claim Irish citizenship. So how difficult is it? You've got to go and get all the evidence for this, for grandparents 
birth certificates and things like that? The foreign birth registry process is um, it's complex. Um, if you have all the the necessary documents, it's not necessarily too difficult. Sometimes it can be quite hard to find grandparents um, birth certificates. You might also need marriage certificates, also death certificates. Um, and, you know, we could be talking about someone who was born in 1850 or something, you know. Um, so you can you can get these. You can apply through a website called www.certificates.ie and you can put in your parents and grandparents details there. Um, so that can be quite difficult. The foreign birth registration can take um, over 12 months. And at the moment, unfortunately, they've paused the process since um, December because of the COVID restrictions. So you know, hopefully in the spring that will open again, but the foreign birth registration can take, yeah, a long bit, quite a long time. Passport process is a bit more straightforward. You can apply online, you can put your details online. You do have to send your documentary uh, evidence physically, um, but that can take um, as little as six weeks. Um, so that's, that's, that's a lot easier and a bit more straightforward. You always have to send off your birth and possibly marriage um, certificates and also some proof of address. Something that some people find quite difficult is that you have to get, um, you have to send off four little passport photos, you know, we've all seen them, um, and you have to get two of them signed by a witness. And the, the list of witnesses can seem slightly arcane, but it's it's usually kind of professional occupations, like a doctor, a nurse, a police, a lawyer, um, but it can't be a relative, and you need a witness to sign two of your photos. It, it takes a bit of patience and a bit of time um, and you, you've not got to give up at the first hurdle because it's something which is worth achieving. I'm saying that. What does it mean to have your Irish citizenship? Um, well, obviously, in the context of Brexit, of the UK leaving the European Union, having an Irish passport gives you visa-free travel rights uh, throughout the European Union um, and a few other states. Um, so you've got the right to move, travel, live um, within the European Union. Um, it doesn't change your right as a citizen in Britain because you claim that you, you're probably already a British citizen. Um, and I, I think last year, um, the Irish passport, there was different kind of indexes, but there's one index that puts the Irish passport as the seventh most powerful in the world. There's one that puts it on third most powerful, powerful in the terms of giving you visa free access to different countries. So beyond the European Union, there's lots of other countries. I mean, the UK passport gets you to a lot of countries. But the Irish one gets you to even more since um, since Brexit. Now, Rory, it, it, there's a census coming up in March, and uh, you know who can sign that as a as an Irish person? Is can I describe myself as Irish, even though I just only have a British passport? Yes, you can absolutely. So, the census is on the 21st of March this year, so just under two months. Um, fortunately, it's four days after St Patrick's Day, so hopefully it will be um, everyone will be feeling particularly Irish around then. So. <laughs> In the England and Wales census, they've actually delayed the census in Scotland until next year. But in the England and Wales census, there's four ways in which you can register your Irishness, if you like. So the first way is if you were born in Ireland or Northern Ireland, you can you can state that. Um, the second way is you can, it asks you what citizenships you hold, and they ask you that through a passport. So um, you might not be able to, Michael, but um, for some people who have an Irish passport, you can you can state that um, as well as a British passport. You don't have to. You can put down as many passports as you do hold. The third way is through national identity. The question is, um, you know, how do you define yourself in, in terms of nationality? And you can put Irish. Um, you can also put Northern Irish, British, English, but you have to, I think you just have to choose one. Then the fourth way is through the question about how you define your ethnic group. So this is very much open to kind of however you want to interpret it, but you do have to just choose one. Um, and in the category, under the white category, there is an option to define yourself as Irish. Um, you can also define yourself um, as an Irish traveller, if you wish. Irish traveller and gypsy is another category. And obviously, you can't just say you were born none if you weren't, but, um, you know, you might want to do that in terms of national identity and ethnic group in your own case, Michael. Yes, yes, that, that's really interesting. I, I think I will. Irish and Britain is very keen to encourage people to kind of engage with their Irishness in those ways through the census, um, because otherwise the community can kind of seem a bit invisible, certainly in terms of second and third generation. If you weren't born in Ireland, but you feel very strongly Irish, um, the national identity and ethnic group question kind of shows the size of the Irish community beyond the first generation people who were born there. So it's it's great for in terms of kind of looking at health data and 
where Irish people live and all that sort of stuff. It's fascinating talking to you. You know, you made it very, very clear and easy to follow. And it's, I know it's quite a complex subject. And I know a lot of people are really interested in what you've just been explaining to us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great. Well, that's all we have time for this month. I hope you've enjoyed our podcast. And thanks again to the guests, Kevin Doonan and Rory Cullen. We'd like to finish off with a piece of music. This is The Hunch, featuring lead vocals by Michael Noonan. One of us. Enjoy, and we'll see you next month. Make his way